Hello everyone, I'm Christy Risk, Senior Editor at Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator for today. The title of today's webinar is Analytical Utility of Mass Spec Liquid Biopsy for NSCLC and Melanoma Samples, and our sponsor is Agena Bioscience. Our panelists today are Dr. Uh, Daryl Irwin, Senior Director of Scientific Affairs at Agena Bioscience, uh, Ms. Weiwei Zhao, Director of the Clinical Genomic Testing Center at KingMed Diagnostic, and Dr. Ellen Gray, Postdoctoral Fellow and, Sci and Senior Researcher at the School of Medical and Health Sciences at Edith Cowan University. Due to the location of our speakers today, this webinar has been pre-recorded, including a preset Q&A session. However, if you do have a question, please send it in. We will send all questions to our speakers, and they will follow up with you after the webinar today. You may type in a question at any time during the webinar. You can do this through the control panel, which usually appears on the right side of your screen. Click on the Q&A box on the upper right side of the control panel. When you click on Send To, please select All Panelists. Dr. Irwin, please go ahead. Thank you, Christy. At Agena Bioscience, our mission is to translate genomic discoveries into mainstream clinical practice. Our workhorse, the Mass Array System, has empowered hundreds of clinical laboratories globally to routinely deliver panels of actionable markers for inherited diseases, pharmacogenomics testing, sample integrity, and today's focus, oncology. This technology delivers exceptional accuracy and sensitivity with a level of throughput and cost structure that provides accessibility to all patients to these panels of markers. Today, we're going to focus on non-small cell lung cancer and melanoma. And through the studies performed by our invited speakers, we can learn together how we can improve on the dismal prognoses of these two common cancer types. Non-small cell lung cancer, whilst it is not the most commonly newly diagnosed cancer, however, 1.6 million is certainly a large number of new cases per year, it is the most common cause of cancer-related death, with 1.42 million deaths annually based on these studies. New targeted therapies are making improvements in progression-free survival and quality of life, but they've minimally altered overall survival mostly due to the advanced stage of this cancer at time of diagnosis. Only about 20% or one-fifth of these cancers are diagnosed when localised at a single site. And even then, surgical resection methods are only effective as a cure in half of these, with only a 56% five-year survival rate. The vast majority of patients are diagnosed after the disease has clearly spread, and they have a dismal prognosis, as can be seen by stage four cancers, which only have a 5% five-year survival rate. Diagnosis of lung cancer is generally performed by histolog histological subtyping. However, even here, many patients cannot get a histological diagnosis as tissue, type, tissue sampling is often too dangerous. Diagnosis and disease monitoring is commonly also performed by imaging, expensive technologies that are only done at, pre, at predefined intervals and not highly frequently via a variety of different methodologies. The spectrum of clinically actionable mutations actually has a disparity depending on the genetic ancestry of the, of, of the patients. EGFR is the most common actionable mutation due to targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapies. And it's much more common to have activating EGFR mutations in East Asia genetic ancestry than it in, is in Caucasian. And thus, EGFR is going to be our focus today in our study on non-small cell lung cancer. So as I mentioned, EGFR is our focus. And when an EGFR activating or sensitizing mutation is observed, those patients respond to EGF, EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapies and are generally put onto first or second generation TKI, being allotinib, gefitinib, or afatinib. However, the vast majority of patients will progress 
And the main cause for progression on these therapies is the acquisition or the selection of the T790M EGFR mutation that weakens or prevents the drugs from binding. If that resistance mutation, so the sensitizing EGFR mutation in addition to the resisting T790M mutation are detected, patients then move on to third generation TKI or osimertinib, an irreversible EGFR TKI that is not, res not resisted by the T790M mutation. But again, those patients ultimately fail therapy. Generally, that failure is through the, C7, the acquisition of a C797S mutation. Now, for those patients that are EGFR sensitizing positive, T790M positive and C797S positive, there are no approved therapies at this point in time, but several compounds are in clinical trials, and there is hope that there will be a fourth generation EGFR TKI therapy that is active against, against this combination. Now, liquid biopsy is already supported as a clinical test, as a first-line option to non-invasively detect resistance mutations on progression of this disease. It is also supported when tissue sampling is not feasible due to the location of the tumour and the risk to the patient. Tissue types, so here are some common tissue types that are commonly provided for pathological analysis. What we see is that more recently there has been a trend for smaller samples such as core needle biopsies or fine needle aspirates, as these are much, much more safer for the patient. However, they yield very few cells and highly variable heterogeneity. These tissues are then put into formalin-fixed paraffin-embedded blocks, which causes cross-linking and severe degradation of the nucleic acids present. Now, this trend in taking smaller and smaller tissue samples coincides with an increase in the number of requested biomarkers and genes in order to assign patients to an ever-increasing number of targeted therapies. And this is a significant challenge for today's molecular pathology laboratories where sample input needs to be a very important consideration for the technology that is selected for these types of tests. Today we are going to focus on the T790M resistance mutation as, is, as it is acquired during the course of first or second generation EGFR TKI therapy, but also is used to assign people onto third generation EGFR TKI. So a liquid biopsy test is approved at this stage as a first-line clinical analysis, as when the T790M mutation is detected in the plasma, these patients respond equally as well as those that have the T790M mutation detected in the tissue to this third-generation EGFR TKI therapy. And thus the detection in plasma prior or without a tissue sample um, it does spare these pa patients a risky or painful tissue biopsy. But as is shown on the screen in front of you, the Aura study showed that when a patient is negative for T790M in the liquid biopsy, on the left-hand side you can see that the pro probability of progression-free survival is not significantly different to those that were positive. And the reason is that yellow line down the bottom, which is the negative T790M plasma patients, is a combination of, of, of two subsets. One, patients that are truly negative for the T790M, and that is that their resistance is not driven by that marker, and therefore they don't respond to, to third generation EGFR TKI. Or false negatives where there isn't sufficient tumor DNA present in the sample. So on the right-hand side, Oxnard and colleagues showed that by using the sensitizing mutation as a measure for tumor DNA presence, this was effective in stratifying that, T that negative group in the plasma into two differential, differential subgroups. The lower yellow line that you see in the right-hand progression-free survival curve, this line is where the tumor sensitizing mutation was detected, but no T790M resistance. So that is the plasma sample contained tumor DNA, but it did not contain the resistance mutation, which is a prerequisite for assignment over to osimertinib therapy after failure of first or second generation EGFR-TKI. 
the upper yellow line is the opposing group. And that is there was no tumour DNA detected and therefore in the liquid biopsy and therefore likely a false positive for the T790M. And the reason for that is that the, the, the tumour itself was not shedding enough DNA into the circulation. So there is the opportunity by combining sensitizing mutations and the resistance mutations in a panel for analysis to stratify these negative patients into these two separate groups. So that is why we have released the new UltraSeq EGFR panel. The UltraSeq EGFR panel contains six variants in a single reaction. It contains those resistance mutations, the T790M and the two nucleotide changes that result in the C797S mutation. But in addition to those resistance mutations, it also contains the L858R and the two 15 base pair deletions of exon 19. These three sensitizing mutations make up 75 to 80% of the observed sensitizing mutations in non-small cell lung cancer. And as I mentioned, this is all delivered in a single reaction with low cost and a one in 1,000 sensitivity for these rare mutations. Now, if your sensitizing mutations isn't one of these three most common ones, the PCR product that we generate from this particular panel can also be used with our larger UltraSeq lung panel without any requirement for reamplification or resampling. That is, from the original PCR product, you can then take that through for the larger panel to do a more extensive and broader EGFR analysis, as well as several other genes, um, to look for some of those more rarer sensitizing mutations. Now, the UltraSeq workflow is quite simple. We start with standard biallelic um, short amplicon PCR. Short amplicon, of course, because this is cell-free DNA and therefore it's already fragmented into around about the 150 to 166 base pairs. We start with a single PCR reaction, simply because that minimizes down to the smallest amount of input material possible in that as long as your template is present in the reaction, you, 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 that, that is your starting amount. So if you wish to achieve one in 1,000 sensitivity, then you've got to put in at least 1,000 molecules. In that, into that single reaction. The next step is that we do single base extension onto that PCR product. But with this, we just do single base extension with only the mutant nucleotide. And there, we do not include the wild type nucleotides. So we're terminating the primer only when a mutant template is present. We have a series of controls in the reaction, which means that we can confirm that all of the steps in this process have, have performed correctly, but we can also use those controls to normalize, uh, to determine the normalized frequency as you'll hear in the next presentations. Following that, we use a magnetic bead to pull out that biotin-bound terminated primer that was terminated on the new, uh, mutant uh, template. Pulling that out and removing all of the unincorporated primers or unextended primers, as well as any of the other salts and other things that are present in the biochemistry reaction, such that we can then fly this on the mass spectrometer. Now, I'm sure you can appreciate in a rare, in a rare mutation, there are only a small number of terminated, mutant terminated molecules present. The mass spectrometer doesn't need a large number of mutant molecules because it pulses hundreds of times on that pad and is able to detect these very rare species, as you can see in the mass spectrum. Now, of course, we do this in a multiplex format so that we can minimize the sample input, as I mentioned before, and achieve that multiplexed analysis of anywhere from five to maybe one or 200 mutations from a single PCR reaction as starting material. So with that, I'd like to hand back to Christy, who can now introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Irwin. As a reminder to webinar participants, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box in the control panel. Next up is Ms. Zhao. Please go ahead. Center of Diagnostic. And today, I would like to talk about um, multiplex detection of EGF. T790 m and original EGFR activating mutations in plasma using UltraSeq. So, first of all, I would like to um, briefly introduce our company. Um, we are the leading um, diagnostic independent diagnostic lab 
uh, in mainland China. We're uh, headquartered in Guangzhou, and we have 37 subsidiaries all over the mainland China, including one in Hong Kong. We're both CAP and ISO 15189 um, accredited lab. Um, we test about 15 million samples annually, including uh, 8 million of uh, pathology tests. Uh, we provide um, over 2,500 tests in our comprehensive manual. And our clinical gen genomic testing center is the fastest growing division in uh, TMAG diagnostics. And our center has over 200 staff, including technical and medical. And we provide more than, and um, here is a little bit of data, we provide more than 1,000 different testing, including cancer and non-cancer, for our um, uh, for our uh, mainly hospital and clinics, and also we provide um, clinical trials for our pharmaceutical clients. And last year, we have tested um, more than 600,000 samples. So uh, we have integrated um, technology platforms in our core lab, in our center, including traditional karyotyping in fish, and of course, um, array, including mass array, and also PCR, and um, first generation and next generation sequencing. So um, for the, uh, over a year, for the last year, we, uh, over a year, we have tested a little bit more than 5,000 um, T790, uh, T7, um, 90M testing for a uh, non small cell lung cancer patient for um, third generation targeted therapy selection using the digital PCR platform. Um, so we chose from these five, uh, more than 500 samples a cohort of 94 archived to see CF DNA, which, um, like I mentioned, uh, tested previously using the droplet digital PCR for T790M, and then with the auto droplet generator as this uh, participate this auto seek study. Um, we originally collected this uh, whole blood samples. Uh, in the strict cell-free DNA BCT tubes, and um, plasma, um, the sample, the plasma was uh, separated, and also extraction is performed was performed within 72 hours. And the CF DNA was extracted from the plasma using the CHIAMP circulating nucleic acid kits or Megamax uh, cell-free DNA, DNA isolation kit on a Kinsey share purification system, and we stored them at minus 20 until uh, tested by digital PCR. And each CF DNA sample was originally quantified by uh, qubit. Uh, with all these archived CF DNA samples, we, um, the samples we were um, tested using the UltraSeq EGFR panel were both the uh, original EGFR activating mutation and the EGFR T790M mutation that causes first and second generation EGFR TKI resistance. Uh, each archived specimen was also tested for degradation and amplifiable copies per microliter using an, uh, a genus CFDNA QCSA to uh, help in sample quality assessment and final result interpretation. Um, we used the same volume of sample input um, which we used for uh, uh, digital PCR technology. 
Uh, unfortunately, among the 94 sample cohorts, there there were five samples failed techn uh, technically in autistic experiments. So the next two slides, I would like to show you the concordance of um, these two technologies um, for the T790M results. But I, I will. Um, I would like to summarize in this slide. Um, Ultrasonic technology um, adopts a relative quantification strategy utilizing normalized intensity, um, which has an approximately dynamic range of 0.1 to 10 percent. So, compare um, this two technologies, the digital. PCR and also, also the ultra seek the concordance we analyzed showed um, very uh, strong concordance uh, results. First of all, in the range of greater than 0.15 percent um, fractional abundance, we found uh, 29 in 30 samples reported concordant positive results. And in the range of less than 0.06% fractional abundance, 39 samples in 40 reported concordant negative results. However, between the frequencies of 0.06 to 0.15%, and 10 of 19 samples showed random discrepancy between the two technologies. And six digital PCR positive samples reported negative by UltraSeq, and four digital PCR negative samples reported positive by UltraSeq. And this slide showed um, the normalized intens intensity by UltraSeq uh, results uh, versus the fact. Um, Fractional abundance by digital PCR. Um, as you can see, the R squared is more than 0.87. In addition to the result, the concordance result of T790M, we also um, detected 16 LA58R result samples, positive. Samples and also 26 of the different exon um, 19 deletion results. And also, we detected one C797 GTC change result. Um, the ultra seek EGFR panel has the capacity to uh, detect the most common EGFR activating mutations and the emerging uh, third generation resistance EGFR C7. In a single well reaction, as you can see um, of our results. So, to conclude, um, ultra C to provide equivalent sensitivity to, to um, digital PDR in detecting uh, G790M, as um, we showed you in our cohort. And also, it performed very well within the uh, stated. Dynamic range of a 0.1 to 10 percent, and there was a one sample that we um, detected positive for the C797 mutation um, that caused by the third generation resistance uh, TKI resistance. However, without um, follow up, we cannot um, um, confirm this result. Um, so that's um, that's my um, results. Um, now I'm turning it, turn it to Christy. Thank you, Ms. Zhao. As a reminder to webinar participants, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box in the control panel. And next up is Dr. Gray. Please go ahead. Thank you, Christy. Um, I'm going to present some of the work that we have been doing um, at Edith Khan University in Western Australia, together with our colleagues at, in Melbourne from the Peter Mack Institute and the Olivia Newton-John Cancer Centre. Um, as 
um, possibly the previous speakers introduced, um, uh, we use this uh, the ultrasic technology for the analysis of circulating tumor DNA, uh, and it's not um, as others have mentioned. Uh, basically, circulating tumor DNA are released from the tumor cells as they're undergoing um, rapid growth and in that process apoptosis and necrosis of some cells. Uh, amongst the circulating tumor DNA, there is cell-free DNA derived from normal uh, cells in the, in the body, uh, which highly contaminated and troubled the, uh, the, the identification of this uh, specific tumor derived DNA. However, uh, the utility of circulating tumor DNA has become very apparent in the recent years, and it allows to, um, to use through the whole uh, process of managing patients with cancer, from early detection of cancer, molecular stratification, so identifying of mutations that will allow effective treatment, as the previous speakers have mentioned, uh, not only for uh, also the monitoring of um, of the evolution of the tumor and therefore the uh, emergence of resistant mutations, and we have been working in this space um, for for the last few years. Uh, however, um, as just as I mentioned before, it's actually quite difficult to identify a specific tumor-associated mutation in this milieu of normal cell-free DNA, and also it's difficult if you have to identify, like in this case, try to find Wally among so many other people, but also try to then, you don't know whether it is, if you don't know a priori the mutations the patient carry, there is a number of mutations that are being associated with a specific cancer that might be present on the sample. And that is why um, we found so useful the use of a panel, cancer-specific panel, for the analysis of circulating tumor DNA. Uh, in previous studies, and as a um, comparative uh, technology, I will be talking about the droplet digital PCR, which we have shown previously that can allow the detection of circulating tumor DNA uh, to a really very low frequency abundance of 0.05% because it's able to separate in droplets these different um, uh, pieces of DNA and, and allow an, a specific PCR for the mutant form versus the wild type um, sequence and therefore identify copy numbers of circulating tumor DNA. Using uh, in particular a targeted technologies like droplet digital as well as the ultraseq is amenable for the analysis of melanoma, which is what I will focus on my talk today. Um, because melanoma have, uh, is, have, is the, have a very high abundance of cases in which either the mutation appears in a hotspot position in BRAF, uh, in codon B600, uh, and there is just few variants of it that appear in around 50 percent of patients, and when they are not uh, mutant in BRAF, another large percent of patients, around 20 percent of patients, will carry NRAS mutations, and then these NRAS mutations, 70 percent of them, will be in codon Q61. So with just two hotspot mutations, uh, hotspot hot uh, sites uh, with different type of mutations on those sites, we can uh, cover a large proportion of melanoma patients. In addition, um, our previous work, we, um, and this is from uh, Stephen Wong from uh, Peter Max, and we also have similar data showing that it's the monitoring of uh, melanoma patients is about targeting BRAF600 mutations or in rats or any other uh, mutation associated with the cancers allow for monitoring of patients through the disease and the amount of circulating tumor DNA in plasma very well correlate with the tumor burden um, uh, of the patient uh, as observed by um, FD PET uh, data. And, and this has been replicated by various groups uh, showing that indeed circulating tumor DNA monitoring 
is a complementary modality to uh, a PET scan, uh, in particular in situations where PET is not available, or also to the, um, identify cases in which there is equivocal result from the imaging technologies and the, whether it's an inflammation or it's actually indeed a progression of the, of the tumor, and therefore sequence tumor DNA allow uh, to, to, to further um, um, define uh, what the disease status in this patient. Um, in addition, uh, the analysis of circulating tumor DNA allows you to not only monitor the, the tumor initial mutation, but also um, similar to the, to, the, to the case of the T790M EGFR mutation in, in lung cancer, uh, in the case of melanoma patients treated with a BRAF inhibitor, uh, um, develop resistance, and one of the mechanisms of resistance is the appearance of a mutation in, in RAS uh, in position Q61. So, um, as represented in this graph, you can see that the circulating tumor DNA decreases as the patient responds to therapy. However, when the patient rebounds uh, and, and relapses from the therapy, uh, develop resistance, and not only the, there is an increase on the original BC Rapid 600. K mutation, but it's also the emergence of uh, of an NRAS mutation, which mediates resistance. Um, however, this, if you conceptualize that we'll have to do this monitoring for multiple NRAS mutations um, during the course of the treatment, it's, it's difficult to actually monitor for the multiple combinations of NRAS mutations that may appear in this patient. So for uh, the use of the technology that allow multi Flexing a number of mutations it will be very useful for this. Um, and as I said before, we know that there is a number of mutations that can cover high proportion of patients in BRAF and RAS, as well um, as other point mutations that have been described in the literature. And that is was uh, was used. That type of information um, uh, was used by uh, the Agina bioscience team to put together um, a, a panel specific for melanoma, which um, targets 13 genes um, that have been um, significantly mutated in melanoma over specific hotspot mutations, uh, and targets basically is a panel of all 63 uh, melanoma-associated mutations. And, and in this table is shown the list of the different mutations targeted in this panel. Many of these mutations within the panel are targeted for more than, with more than one reaction, allowing for more accurate call of the, the presence of these mutations. So for this study to validate uh, this test, we decided to compare it to droplet digital PCR, which is now becoming a gold star technology uh, for the analysis of circulating tumor DNA. And we analyzed um, samples from three different sites, so um, as, as described here, and they all were sent to the central lab uh, from Agena at, in Queensland, in Brisbane. Um, and, and actually, the parallel droplet digital PCR of the mutations identified by Ultrasic as well as um, BRAF mutations in these samples were done in each one of the labs separately, uh, which uh, not only allows to, to evaluate the platform, but also um, it, it separates the two uh, set of analysis. And in fact, the ultra sick team was blinded to the result of the droplet digital PCR and the presence of mutations, which provides us as a very um, effective way of comparing the platforms with blinded. A blind in, uh, with, uh, with the, where the technicians are blind to the results. In addition, we included uh, 20 healthy controls uh, from sample, samples from 20 healthy controls uh, from, that we collected in Perth, uh, which also were sent to, for ultra sick, uh, in mixed with the melanoma samples, and, and we compared them the results, also to allow us to determine what is their background. And in fact, the samples had a very high specificity, 
there was no detection of mutation in any of the 20 healthy control samples uh, submitted for analysis. Um, in this graph, I show the correlation of the results of the frequency abundance detected in these samples uh, on the mutation detected in the samples by droplet digital PCR against the ultra seq normalized intensity. Um, while ultra seq um, might not claim that it is um, there is a quantitative technology as droplet digital PCR it is, and we were uh, rather uh, surprised how well um, the, the, the normalized intensities and correlate with the frequency of the droplet digital PCR. Um, of note, at, towards the end, uh, and that's something that the, 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 the Agena team um, mentions, is so at high frequency abundance, and you can notice in some, in some of the few samples of very high frequency abundance, there is actually a saturation of the ultra seq um, uh, chemistry. And in fact, you might obtain less intensity, normalized intensity, than, than uh, when compared to the frequency abundance of the digital PCR. Um, in addition, we then compare we compare um, the range of, so this is all the different, uh, the frequency abundance as well as the copy per mil of plasma, identifying each one of these samples by droplet digital PCR, uh, which most of them was identified also by the ultra mass array ultra seq, uh, with the exceptions of the four samples marked with an asterisk. And I wanted to, to highlight this because um, the, the, it was, there was not the case, there was a limit of detection of samples that were detected by droplet digital PCR and not by the mass array ultra seq, but it's actually we could detect that at the lowest samples detected by droplet digital PCR were also detected by the mass array. It just happened that in cases of four samples, this is an stochastic effect or uh, issue with sample transportation that uh, they fail to be detected um, by the ultra seq technology, but it was not necessary because there is a limit of detection uh, that we can, that a cutoff that we could define from these results. Um, the next set of data, also highlights uh, not only that if the mass array was effective on detecting mutations in the RAF, um, which are the most common mutation found in melanoma, but also across multiple other loss size, um, and this is different. Many of the other mutations that were identified by mass array and validated by droplet digital PCR. In particular, we were um, surprised uh, by the number of DPH3 promoter mutations identified by the uh, by these two technologies and, and in, in these patients, uh, indicating that indeed it's a quite a common mutation um, in melanoma patients that could use, be used as an alternative to for monitoring patients with melanoma. Um, uh, finally, what um, what we also did, we basically compared uh, the, the the detection um, the concordance of the assay. Um, for the detection of PRAFI 600E, which is possibly one of the most um, uh, in, uh, mutations that, that the clinician will be interested in because allow them uh, for molecular stratification of patients uh, to guide treatment options, in this case for BRAF uh, inhibitors. And we analyzed 17 samples that were tested by droplet digital PCR as well as mass array um, to identify whether they were positive or negative calls by both technologies, and, and there was high concordance with the Cohen co coefficient of 0.8 to 6, and there were only six samples that were either positive by one method or another, um, um, that they were discordant. Uh, all the other samples were highly concordant by this technology. And um, similar to, to the data, the way we uh, presented is these samples, and I should have highlighted this, is usually in the lower range uh, of, uh, of frequency abundance 
uh, therefore more susceptible to sampling error. Finally, uh, we uh, attempt to do uh, a similar um, a monitoring of the levels of circulating tumor DNA in three patients in which we have longitudinal samples uh, tested by both technologies. And uh, in general, each graph, the solid line represents the amount of copies per mil uh, of plasma by droplet digital PCR, and the dashed line with the squares represents the normalized intensity uh, derived from the ultra -seek, um mass array. And, and if you, you could see, they both trained in, in the same direction and it indeed indicate the presence and increase of circulating tumor DNA over the course of, um, of treatment and failure to treatment in these three patients treated by either, uh, immunos either immunotherapy uh, with pembrolizumab uh, on the last patient basically through nivolumab and various um, rounds of, uh, of, of treatment and progressions as well as prog uh, uh, disease uh, response to, to treatment. Um, just finally, I would like to conclude that the ultra thick melanoma panel uh, shows to be a sensitive, a sensitive drop of digital PCR for the detection of circulating tumor DNA in this cohort of patients, melanoma patients. And the mass array system enabled rapid and sensitive genotyping for the detection of multiple melanoma associated mutations. I would like to thank the study participants. Uh, as well as my colleagues at Edith Cowan University um, and the oncologist uh, responsible for recruiting uh, the patients for, for these studies, as well as my colleague uh, Peter Mack, uh, especially Stephen Wong, and uh, on the leading institution cancer center, Alex Dobrovic and Tom Witowski, and as well as the Agena team for their support of the study and, and the help with um, these results. Uh, thank you, and I pass back to Christy. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Uh, before we begin the preset Q&A session, uh, we'd like to ask attendees to give us feedback by taking our exit survey after the webinar. And we'll now start the Q&A. Uh, Weiwei, the first question is for you. Um, the UltraSeq EGFR looks like it performed well above the 0.1% minor allele frequency. However, there look to be three negatives uh, above 0.1%. Can you comment on why those were not called? Um, yeah, um, actually, Dr. Gray just mentioned in her talk that um, random errors occur um, when we don't have, we have a very few positive copies uh, exist in the reaction to start with. Uh, so the, sometimes the technology fails to capture them. Great. And can you comment on the similarities and differences between the UltraSeq and DDPCR workflows? Uh, yeah. Uh, we found that uh, DDPCR is quite easy and um, it's a, a more straightforward workflow, but um, it's a very good technology to test uh, a single, I like um Sing, a single variant like a T790M. Um, However, UltraSeq works very well, like um, MetaRay works very well in general uh, with the mid sized uh, panel. So, uh, with the, this, this um, mutation size, panel size, I think it works very well with the multi, uh, multiplex technology, which um, digital PCR doesn't have. Um, thank you. Um, Ellen, over to you. Is the melanoma panel a custom panel or is it available through Agena? Um, it, it is available through Agena now. Um, it, it was designed custom, uh, as a custom panel uh, in discussion with the different groups in Australia uh, working in melanoma, but now it's an available through Agena. And you talked about a handful of common hotspot mutations, but the full UltraSeq panel contains more than 60 variants. What is the reason to include more variants? 
Um, the, the reason to include more variants is because while there is a hot spot, a very common hot spot in BRAF 600 and in MRAF Q61, uh, the rest of the patients, so, uh, so around 50% will be BRAF mutant, around 20% of melanoma cases will be MRAF mutant, they are not usually overlapping, and then there will be around another 20 to 30% of patients that will not carry either of these mutations. And, and it is hard to define what they will carry. Uh, therefore, I think a lot of the variants we'll be covering will be also uh, trying to, 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 to detect mutation in the rest of the patients. The other reason why there is so many variants is because even in BRAF V600 and in RASQ61, there is multiple mutations uh, that can emerge. And even when they result in the same amino acids, there is different nucleotide uh, combinations in which they can arrive, uh, um, appear. Uh, therefore, to, to accommodate all of these variants, that's why the panel ended up having so many variants. Um, Wei Wei, KingMed runs a number of different types of technologies. Um, what types of testing do you typically prefer to do on mass array? Yeah, um, like I said, um, mass array provides a very good technology for um, mid-sized pan uh, variant panel. So we use that um, to do. Over the year, we have been using it for an inherited deafness genetic screening in newborns, and also some pharmacology, pharmacogenetics testing, which we um, co-designed with uh, Adina for adults and the pediatric needs. And you mentioned that the same volume of sample input was used for both testing technologies when allowable. Uh, can you comment on when these two technologies had different sample input requirements? Yes, yeah, since both the technology digital PCR and uh, ultraseq are based um, PCR based detection methods, um, they pretty much use the similar uh, sample input. However, with the multiplex technology uh, of the ultraseq, uh, you can have uh, more use of the same sample volume, especially when you have very um, precious amount of the uh, sample. Do you have the DNA samples? Okay, thank you. Um, Ellen, back over to you. Are there any technical issues or considerations uh, when working with plasma samples? Um, yes, I think um, it, it has become apparent that, that either you, you, you can collate the blood in, in EDTA tubes, uh, but then you will need to process rap uh, relatively rapidly um, the, the sample, separate the plasma, uh, ideally recommended be within two hours, four hours, uh, to, 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 to avoid the release of, of normal DNA into, into the plasma from the cell uh, in the blood. Um, uh, however, there is various type of um, tubes now available for collection, and we, we mentioned the streak tubes, a lot of our Studies also use structure for collection, which uh, allows you to, to possibly keep the tube for around even seven days before the plasma is separated. Um, these different laboratories have different protocols, and there is various tubes in the market, but that's uh, one of the main issues. Of course, the extraction, uh, there is also uh, different variants for the extraction of cell-free DNA from the plasma, um, which may also result in, in, in in, in different efficiency of recovering of free DNA. And can you speak to the process of analyzing your data on the mass array? Is this a manual process or is there available software? Yes, there is a, um, an available uh, software uh, provided by, by Agina. It's, it's really um, simple. Um, uh, the, the feeding the data from the, from the system into the software and actually uh, getting the results. However, you can still uh, see the, the, the profile um, on, and the peaks uh, and, and, and decide whether, whether there is any issue on the raw data that you 
would like to query or, or discuss, but it is relative, it's really simple. Great, thank you. Uh, wait, wait, is there any need to try to detect below 0.1% or is that sufficient for liquid biopsy? Uh, for our experience, um, for either uh, like digital PCR or next generation sequencing and now ultraseq, uh, we think 0.1% is pretty sufficient for uh, liquid biopsy for our uh, clients since uh, we collect normally collect just um, stick tube of whole blood, um, which is 10 ml of whole blood, and uh, from that we um, normally uh, have separate four ml of plasma, which we know that it contains about three to five thousand copies of total CF DNA, and with this, um, it is not statistically possible to go below 0.1% when there are only uh, several thousand copies of templates. So we, we do believe from our experiences that 0.1% um, is necessary and achievable in clinical liquid biopsy and it's um, pretty sufficient for our patients. Um, and how would uh, someone approach testing a patient's liquid biopsy on the mass array for a patient who has a rare activating mutation that's not on the UltraSeq EGFR? Potentially, I can take that question for you, Weiwei. Um, so the, the PCR reaction that is generated in the UltraSeq PCR is also compatible with our larger UltraSeq lung panel, which includes a variety of mutations in the so extended EGFR mutations, and there's around about uh, 48 uh, extended EGFR mutations in that panel, as well as BRAF, KRAS, ERBB2 slash HER2 and pick 3 ca mutations. So if the, if the patient isn't carrying those, those most common three activating mutations, you can use that same PCR product without reamplifying to look at the larger panel, to use, utilize the larger panel to track those rarer mutations. Great. Thank you very thank much, Daryl. Um, and what were the parameters for calling the results of the DDPCR T790M assay positive? Um, how many positive and negative droplets minimum uh, were required? Um, I think a different laboratory has their uh, different parameters for us to, um, after uh, our validation testing. Um, we first, we have two parameters to look into. First one, uh, we look how many um, droplets that it, it, every sample generates. Um, we have to have um, more than 10,000 of the droplets. And then we look into, we would look into the T790M channel and if there are more than two positive calls, we would call the sample positive for T790M. Great, thank you, Wei Wei. Um, Ellen, TERT is a very important emerging marker for melanoma, but it's not on the UltraSeq melanoma panel. Uh, can you tell us why that is? Um, yes, um, yes. Um, um, a lot of my work have been around identifying mutations in TERT, um, so it is a pity that it's not in the UltraSeq melanoma panel. Um, it, but I have, I have to say, even for the drop the digital PCR for TERT, uh, it is a difficult region to amplify. Um, it's incredibly busy rich, um, and and you need to add extra um, chemis chemicals to, to to achieve that amplification. So, so it was not amenable to to the to the panel to the amplification of the Wibex panel. Uh, however, um, I'm aware that TERT is on on the Agena Iplex high sensitivity melanoma panel. Which is perhaps not as sensitive as sick, but it can achieve um, a sensitivity down to one percent, um, which um, can can be used. Uh, it could be used in some of these uh, samples. But I agree that that it would have been great to have it on the 
Great. And finally, um, under what circumstances do you conduct liquid biopsy for melanoma? Would you say it's for diagnosis or monitoring or progression? And which markers are the most important for these purposes? Um, yes, indeed. Um, I think for all of them. Um, however, I think for the most, uh, depending on the resources, of course, of, of the of the hospitals or, or the giving institute. Um, I think diagnosis is supposed to be the, not diagnosis, but um, stratification for treatment uh, decision is possibly the, the most common use. So basically before this, for the, to know the patient carrier BRAF mutation, to then put the patient in a BRAF inhibitor is a useful point, entry point into treatment. Um, once it's been, the patients on treatment or even other treatment like immunotherapy, monitoring is um, is, is a very useful um, uh, 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 is a is a it's a common use of liquid biopsy uh, in melanoma many other cancers because um, it allows to provide uh, rapid information on whether the patient is responding to treatment whether they need to treatment adjustment that's another uh, area. Uh, of interest, especially in the context of trials, or um, and and also to monitor for progression, the emergence of resistance, especially having a multiplex panel allows you to monitor for um, for resistance and progression. Uh, in in those cases, um, it will then uh, um, enable a rapid change on therapy, uh, especially for second line therapies. In the case of melanoma, for change just on epigraph inhibitors to immunotherapy. And in all of those um, cases, I think one of the the the, the interesting liquid biopsy and rapid identification of progression is because we know that many of these treatments will work better if the tumor burden is small. So the quicker you detect that there is a relapse and um, and the tumor is regrowing. Um, is 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 important to take to to observe that rapidly and take uh, to to adjust the therapy uh, to those to those situations. And what is the most important markers for these purposes? Um, uh, I would say it at the end. It, of course, the rough mutations are important for treatment identification. I think that's a big focus of a lot of pathology departments. Um, however, uh, for monitoring purposes, you basically need to track uh, the mutation that the patient has, and that could be um, there is a, a myriad of, of mutation that the patient, the melanoma patients, uh, may have that that could be useful for monitoring disease. Great, thank you, Ellen. And those are all the questions we have for now. As I've said, we'll send attendee questions to our panelists and they will follow up with our audience. We'd like to thank Daryl Irwin, Weiwei Zhao, and Ellen Gray, and our sponsor, Agena Bioscience. As a reminder, please look out for the pop-up survey after you log out to provide your feedback. If you missed any part of this webinar or wish to listen to it again, a link to an archived version will be emailed to all attendees. Thank you for joining us for this Genome Webinar.